broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world. The Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of Mike'd Up. By the way, the mic is not Mike Boris. It's this microphone right here. So people sent some emails. Says, is that you? I'm like, no, no. I spell my name with a K. Uh, the short version, uh, not a C. Uh, we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about quite a few things actually going on in the uh, in the church and politics and the relationship between uh, uh, liberal Catholics or generic Catholics, cafeteria Catholics. They're known by a lot of names, none of them particularly flattering. And the culture, and specifically in this uh, campaign season, the political season, what has the effect been on the culture of lukewarm Catholics? Now, we're going to open up the microphones later in the show, but I'm going to give you the number right now. It's 646 200 646-200-0903. You can call in that way if you're on the Blog Talk page. You can, if you've got Skype, you can click on Skype and call in that way. Or just pick up your phone so you can walk around. 646-200-0903. And before you get going with a show on American stuff today, uh, Pope Benedict uh, made some uh, folks from this particular part of the world saints, declared them to be saints over the weekend. The first one. Uh, is Saint Kateri Tekawitha. I was just in that region uh, of New York giving a talk about, uh, I think it was about two months ago or so, uh, and uh, people there are very excited about that. And, uh, you know, lo- lovely woman. She was a Mohawk Indian. She was baptized by Jesuit missionaries, and her uh, fellow Mohawks did not take to her conversion too kindly. She was constantly persecuted uh, by them. So uh, uh, she died of the plague as a young girl. She hadn't turned 25 yet. So uh, God bless Kateri Tekawitha, who is now Saint Kateri. And another saint uh, that Pope Benedict declared is Mother Marianne Cope. She was a Franciscan religious sister. Now, she lived considerably longer than uh, uh, 25 years. She lived to be almost 80. And she was a uh, deeply involved in ministry work to the leprosy colonies, leper colonies in Hawaii, like St. Damien. So uh, we have two new American saints here. It's our saints from the American continent. So uh, we are going to be dedicating this show and asking them to, uh, since they obviously have ties here, to uh, uh, help guide us in this election season. And as always, we are coming to you from the Archbishop, the Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Studio here inside St. Michael's Media and ChurchMilitant.tv. We always kind of have a standing dedication to uh, uh, our shows and our programs here to uh, Venerable Bishop Sheen because we uh, we're in desperate need of a new studio. Our old one had been foreclosed on. The people who were there in the place before him were being very kind to us as landlords, but they went bankrupt, and we had to find a new place to live because the bank was going to foreclose on that building and get rid of it. So we prayed in earnest, in earnest, to Archbishop Sheen, and one of his uh, 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 <laughs> he answered the prayer. They were a very generous supporter of ours who. Uh, he and his wife heard of our dilemma and gave us the two hundred thousand dollars for this beautiful building that we're in now that you've seen many times on the uh, on our video side of our of our house. So thank you, Archbishop Sheen. I have a little picture here, actually, of him, a little card, and there's a relic, a, uh, a little piece of his, one of his cassocks here. I don't know where there's a camera that can see that, but there we are, and it sits right here on every radio show. So. God bless you, and thank you, Bishop Sheen. So we're going to launch into a little discussion here on American influence uh, and Catholic influence uh, colliding in the election season. Now, some of you may have heard that um, a a Senate candidate in Indiana uh, for the U.S. Senate, Richard Murdoch, uh, made a comment the other night at a speech, uh, at a debate, actually, where he was getting a little, uh, uh, well, we're just going to play the clip for you and then let you, uh, let you judge for yourselves and talk about it. He says the question is about abortion and what happens in the case of uh, the difficult cases, rape, incest, etc. Here's what he said. I struggled with it myself for a long time, but I came to realize life is that gift from God. And I think even when life begins in that horrible situation of rape, that it is uh, something that God intended to happen. Uh, it got cut off there, folks, but what he said was... Uh, uh, when life begins in that horrible situation of rape, that it is something that God intended to happen. Now, if you look at that sentence, the it he is referring to is that the life beginning. It is not the rape. And the way this is being spun by uh, you know, liberal media 
uh, is that, uh, oh, he has no compassion for women who are raped, uh, which is ridiculous. It's, I mean, there's two things you need to concentrate on. First of all, that's not what he said. When he was at, questioned about this again, he came back and said, you know, I'm being misconstrued and misinterpreted and, you know, misquoted, essentially. And he is. If you read the sentence, I struggled with it myself, the it meaning what about the cases of rape, uh, for a long time. And I think life is a gift from God. And when life begins, parenthetically, in that horrible situation of rape, close parentheses, that it is something that God intended to happen, the life not the rape. And of course, he's correct there. Uh, But this is another example of uh, the the kind of weird situation that Republicans find themselves in when it comes to the issue of abortion, certainly Republican leadership. You know, they've never clearly come out and said there's this constant waffling on the part of Republican leadership on the question of abortion. You know, the Democratic leadership has no waffling whatsoever. If you see a fetus, kill it. That's their position. The, Amer- the, the, the Republican position is essentially uh, whenever you, you know, it kind of depends on the circumstances. We protect life, uh, but there's a case over here that we don't. They undermine, constantly undermine their own thing, because their own argument, philosophically, because they're always playing for the votes. They're never playing for the truth. Look, if a life is a life is a life, then it doesn't matter how it was conceived. It doesn't matter if it was rape, incest, whatever. But the Republicans are constantly backpedaling and trying to dance around this issue and sort of win the popular vote on this. If you're not going to stand up for the truth, you know, look, there's no exceptions, no compromises. That's it. And if you go down in flames on that, well, you went down defending the truth. But see, this is what happens when you get into politics and you start mixing all of these exceptions. The same thing happened with Paul Ryan in the debate with uh, Joe Biden. All of a sudden, oh, no, no, we're pro-life, we're pro-life for all. You know, I think life begins at conception. However, life that begins at conception as a result of rape or incest, well, that doesn't have as much, you know, value as a life that was begun in love or, you know, not in those horrible circumstances. It's a big problem for for, uh, it's a very big problem for the Republicans because philosophically they keep messing themselves up on this issue. You need to come out and say and be as emphatic uh, on the one end, because that's the truth, that they are on the other end, uh, as the Democrats are on the other end, which is essentially, you know, anybody should be allowed to kill a child anytime they want for whatever reason they want, and it's a woman's right, we're not going to say, Dang, keep your groceries off my ovaries and all that ridiculous stuff. Let's move on to the election very quickly, give you a little electoral college update right now. The way the map is going, and by the way, for those of you who, uh, who watch with some, uh, uh, some regularity, uh, there is, uh, we produce every Friday, we've got two more to go before the election, we produce each Friday and put out over the weekend a, a show we've called Electoral College Update. And that Electoral College Update, uh, we sort of review what's going on. And I'll tell you, what has happened in the last two weeks, three weeks, uh, since that first debate in Denver, you talk about, uh, you talk about a, a, a turnaround, and perhaps one for the ages uh, in the political campaign, nobody in their right mind who follows politics at that time would have said that uh, if you were to come two weeks before the election, less than two weeks before the election, that uh, Romney would be within striking distance and like a 51-49 or, uh, you know, you know, 52-48 kind of chance trailing as the underdog, but barely people would have told you you're out of your mind. The Electoral College map for Obama three weeks ago he could lose 10 states and still walk into the White House. Well, that map has gotten considerably smaller now, so much so, and we'll be going into this on our show, uh, Electoral College or Electoral Update, uh, this coming weekend. But right now, Ohio is the key for both campaigns. If, if Romney wins Ohio, it will be virtually impossible for Barack Obama to win re-election. He could, but there are six, right now, six states that are uh, undecided or toss-ups. They are Wisconsin, Colorado, Nevada, Iowa, and New Hampshire, and Ohio. Because of, because of all the other states and how they've been decided or you know, the, pretty much you know, which camp they're in, which, you know, whose column Romney's or Obama's column they're in, here's the point. Uh, that there aren't that many electoral college votes left. Remember, you have to get to 270. If you don't get to the 270, you don't win. So if Romney, if Romney wins Ohio, that means that Obama has to do a clean sweep and win all Wisconsin, Colorado, Nevada, Iowa, and New Hampshire in order to reclaim the White House. It's probably unlikely, very unlikely, that if Romney wins Ohio— 
it's probably very unlikely that all of these other states are going to vote for uh, are, are going to vote for Obama. That just, you know, one state sort of tends to follow another, and when they're close like this, you generally don't see, if you, you think about 2008, all those close states, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Indiana, Ohio, they all broke the same way. That's pretty typical in American politics. So if Obama loses Ohio, it's bye-bye, Michelle. If, however, Obama wins Ohio, Romney still does have a path to the White House. He'd have to win Wisconsin under any math, but if he won Wisconsin, then he could put together a coalition of those five remaining states, Wisconsin, Colorado, Nevada, uh, Iowa, and New Hampshire. He could put together the winning combination he would need in there. He doesn't need to win them all. But if Romney wins Ohio, Obama needs to win all of those. So as the Electoral College shapes up right now, uh, it all comes down to Ohio. It looks like the, 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 the range of votes in Ohio looks to be that Obama is in the lead. We're just looking at the latest update right now. He's in the lead. It's a range between a tie and a lead. You don't see any Ohio polling as of today that has put Romney in the lead. It's always a tie or Obama, but it is neck and neck close. Uh, And that's it. I mean, whoever wins Ohio probably, well, I'd say if Romney wins Ohio, it's just about lights out for Obama. If Obama wins Ohio, it's sort of lights out for Romney, but he does have one small little path to still get to the White House. So that's the Electoral College update. Let's go back now. Uh, we have Barry from Mobile, Alabama on right on the phone right now. Barry, uh, how you doing? Good, good. Thanks for uh, taking my call. Um, you know, as we talk about the um we talk about the lukewarm Catholics and the teachings or non-teachings of the church. Uh, just within the last uh, several Sundays, uh, we've had uh, a gospel uh, from two weeks ago that talked about the uh, rich having a difficult time getting uh, to heaven, kind of like passing through the, the eye of uh, the camel, passing through the eye of a needle. And then two Sundays before that, uh, you know, we had the Lord talking about. Uh, in the second reading about the rich, um, you know, weeping and wailing uh, about your, uh, you know, your rotten, rotted away clothes, et cetera, and your gold and silver have corroded. And I just, I just wonder, I never hear anyone, bishops or priests even, talking about, uh, you know, trying to save the rich. I mean, if, if we just written them off, I mean, if we just not, <laughs> as a church, you know, saying, okay, you've got yours, you know, no reason to uh, minister to you. And if we did, you know, if the bishops and the priests went out and told these folks that you're in great peril, eternity is in great peril, um, you know, maybe it would take some of the social uh, justice pressure off of, uh, you know, the church and the state and all. And well, I'd like to know your thoughts. Oh, well, th- well, thanks very much, Barry. I appreciate that. You know, it is kind of funny. I, I, I do think the rich and the wealthy are ministered to in the church, uh, <laughs> but uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, you know, there is a... Uh, uh, I think there's a great, you know, reluctance. Look, these, co- these conversations come up all the time on, uh, with regard to, you know, what's going on in the church, and I think there's a great reluctance on the part of many leaders in the church, you know, some bishops, some priests, uh, you know, people who are relying on donations from very wealthy people for, you know, to endow this chair at a university or that building at a college or, you know, this wing in a hospital, you know, that, that are Catholic institutions. And there's a great deal of fear, I think, on their part to uh, challenge and confront and say these sorts of things that you brought up. I think they're nervous to say these things. And, uh, uh, you know, as they're nervous to say a lot of things, and I think they're nervous to say things in parishes because they're afraid people will get up and walk out if you say something about contraception or, uh, you know, homosexuality or something like that. And they're afraid people, and you know what? Some people will get up and walk out. Oh, well. Uh, you know, people got up and walked away from our Lord in uh, Capernaum, too, when he talked about the uh, being the bread of life. So uh, thanks for your call, Barry. I do, I do think the rich, everybody needs ministering, too, and I do think the rich are uh, are kind of treated as something more of a hands-off because, uh, a hands-off approach because of the, uh, uh, you know, what could, you know, uh, potentially backfire in the, in the financial realm. Okay, so... Um, the Brookings Institute in D.C. Uh, conducted a very extensive poll, uh, very extensive research, actually. A poll wouldn't even be a good way to put it. This was a very, very in-depth uh, uh, project they worked on. And they were talking about the uh, religion and politics and everything. They, they, they got into some specific religions, uh, particularly uh, Catholicism. And here's what they discovered. 
Um, this is from a poll they just really, or the survey they just released yesterday. There are more what are called social justice Catholics than there are right to life Catholics. And social justice, 60% of Catholics they uh, included in the survey, 60% of them uh, counted themselves as social justice Catholics compared to about 30%. Twice as many Catholics who self-identified as Catholics said they were more concerned about social justice issues like poverty than they were about questions such as abortion or contraception or you know, euthanasia. Now, another point they brought out in this poll is social justice Catholics are more likely than right-to-life Catholics to favor Obama, 60 to 37%. So you know, out of every you know, roughly 100 Three or uh, out of every uh, five, three will favor Obama. Two right to lifers will uh, uh, will vote for uh, uh, Romney, uh, and the right to life Catholics just essentially just flipped around. Right to life Catholics support the right the more right to life candidate in the uh, in the election, which is Romney. And I say more in quotes, uh, and the more social justice Catholics um, support Obama, and that was true. Uh, you could take it to the bank. That was true back in uh, uh, back in the 2008, as we saw 54% of Catholics, self-identified Catholics, voted for uh, Obama. So um, a fellow named Dan Shea, uh, who uh, follows us and is a viewer, sent us a paper, a, an article that he had written, and he had some really wonderful quotes in it. And we'd like to kind of keep referring back to that because the topic in tonight's show is really what have lukewarm Catholics done uh, what have they caused to happen to the culture? He wrapped up his paper with this, uh, or his article, with this particular paragraph I'd like to quote and say, thank you, Dan, if you're listening, thank you for this. He says, quote, In this licentious age, the void between a Catholic's personal faith and his lack of public input may just border on hypocrisy. The common good demands individuals sacrifice their level of comfort for the good of the nation. I'll go back and repeat that. The common good demands individuals sacrifice their level of comfort for the good of the nation. Hence, not only is the culture in peril, but also in different souls. Thank you very much, Dan. That is a, uh, uh, actually is a very big, uh, 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 is, it's a very big topic. You know, a lot of people are sort of so focused, Catholics are so focused in on this election, we forget and the end of the day, it's not about who wins the White House. It's not about this piece of legislation or that piece of legislation. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it really is who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's the real, uh, the real issue here. We'd like to remind you also that you can join our chat room. It was exceedingly busy last week's show. Uh, and our big topic is, has America ever truly welcomed the Catholic Church? Has that ever happened? Has America ever really welcomed the Catholic Church? Uh, we'd like to play a... Uh, uh, sound recording for you. Now, we're going to go back. Now, many of you may know Archbishop Sheen, Fulton Sheen, from you know his different writings and all that and his TV show, but something a lot of people seem to forget, Archbishop Sheen was a truly dedicated American patriot. He was dedicated to not necessarily just the concepts that America was founded on, but you know, the, the better angels, as Abraham Lincoln would say. He was really dedicated. To that. I served Mass for Bishop Sheen on the bicentennial, July 4th, 1976, in San Francisco. He was the guest homilist, and what a tremendous... I still remember the uh, bits and pieces of the, of the homily he gave that day. It was tremendous. He is, was, still is, uh, very, very concerned about the soul of the nation, and he saw way back when the danger of how the political and social order could become the fixation as people started to sort of drift away and turn their backs on God, lose interest in religion, in the spiritual, and start to focus on the temporal. We'd like to play, we're going to play a number of his quotes dealing with this throughout the show, so we'd like to play this first one. But in any case, it was the third temptation of our blessed Lord not to be concerned with the divine, but to be concerned only with the social and political order. Now, he's talking about, uh, obviously, the uh, third temptation of our blessed Lord out in the desert from uh, Satan, uh, who says, you know, bow down, and I'll, you know, bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. He was, uh, 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 that was a theme that Bishop Sheen harped on quite a bit, the responsibility, what goes on in the, uh, you know, what goes on in the social order, you know, that we start to replace 
so much of our concern on the spiritual. And this is what's happened in the social justice uh, movement that has sort of grabbed hold of the church and started this stranglehold uh, on the church. And uh, that there's all this emphasis on trying to achieve some sort of you know, utopia here on earth through legislation and control of a political party and control of an agenda. And that's not at the end of the day, my fellow Catholics, what we're in this world for. We are in this world to, number one, save our souls by cooperating with grace and the sacraments, etc. Number two, in order to spread the gospel to other people to also enhance their chance at salvation. At the end of the day, that's what we're here for. Yes, sometimes these things are better achieved if the culture is not as coarse and horrible and favoring murder and all that, but we have that mission to do regardless of what the culture is. And a lot, I think a lot of Catholics kind of seem to lose, lose touch with this. I'm going to take a quick phone call here and then come back to this. John from Massachusetts, you're on the phone. How are you? Hi, how are you, Mike? Doing very well. What can I do for you? Uh, I called a couple of weeks ago, and I do have to say, if they don't have a premium membership, sign up. <laughs> it's, just, it's a great show. And no, I know you didn't pay me to say that. Um, and I know you're busy. But it is worth it. It really is. If they don't have a premium membership, they're missing out. Um, what I called to ask you, I asked you three quick questions. One, when you speak about a rape where a child is conceived, are you aware of the studies that have been done that women who do not abort the baby and have the baby overcome the traumatic experiences of rape sooner and much better than women who do abort the baby. And most women who do abort the baby are doing so because of pressure from the outside, their family, IG, you know, their, their, EG, their family. But you mentioned that, and yes, that's a pro-life platform that nobody talks about. And maybe it's an area that the Republicans don't want to get into, but in the case of rape, it is still a child. And most women who do not abort actually end up recovering from the rape much better than those who do not. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it. No, I haven't heard the specific uh, data supporting that, but it, it makes sense. Look, if, if, you're, you know, if you're a woman and you're raped and then you abort the child, what are you left with? You're left with you know, the memories of the rape. And then at some point down the road, you know, the knowledge that, you know, you know, that what you did under those, you know, horrible pressing circumstances. And again, with the, uh, uh, you know, with the question of, you know, probably all, all, si- all kinds of outside pressure being applied. But if you keep the child, you've got to imagine if it's your child, uh, which it is, despite the circumstances, horrible as they are, uh, that the child was conceived in, he's still your child. And, you know, you, I mean, imagine the thought of sitting there thinking, you know, when you see your little boy running around who's four or five, six or something, the thought that would come into your mind that, wow, I might have killed him. Uh, it just makes sense. It just makes sense that it's got to be, uh, you know, easier to cope with the after effect, the emotional, horrible, psychological trauma of the rape, you know, after it, when you have, when you still have this precious human being in front of you. I mean, it's got to seem... Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that you would opt for abortion seems to me that it would come back as sort of a double haunt against you. So, yeah, I'm not surprised if studies are showing that, it, you know, the, the woman, the, the, the victim of the rape, uh, the mother actually fares better psychologically, emotionally, spiritually if she keeps the child. Of course, that makes, that, that makes total sense. Um, we'd like to talk about a little, uh, play another quote from Bishop Sheen here. And we're talking about social issues. And he, ha- you know, he said this you know, decades ago, decades and decades ago. But I want you to listen to the insight that he had with regard to social issues. As he sort of pegs the culture. He pegs the culture spot on where we are right now. And Bishop Sheen's been dead for you know, over 30 years. And as you hear what he's saying, listen to the insight. This is why he has Venerable in front of his name right now. He was always, always, always so close closely aligned with our Lord and the Church and the faith, and he had this tremendous insight, this wisdom. So uh, we're going to play this, this next one for you on social issues. Well, first thing is God is dead. Uh, in other words, we have nothing left in, in this world except the world itself. If there's any hope, it's technology and science. Maybe if we just give enough time. 
Technology may be able to take care of all of our diseases. There'll be no more poverty. But there's no such thing as guilt or sin. We have only to deal with social issues. This is one of the despairing pictures of the modern world. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the voice of a prophet. Did he nail the condition and the problems that the church is experiencing right now, particularly in the United States, uh, or not? And he was, you know, he was a thoroughgoing American, loved America, you know, went to baseball games, et cetera, et cetera. He, uh, but he, he knew this culture, and he could see where it was going. And listen to that last line, but there is not such a thing as guilt or sin. We have only to deal with social issues this is one of the despairing pictures of the modern world. Boy, did he nail that perfectly. We're going to go to a call here from Dennis in Boise, Idaho. Dennis, what's up? How are you? Oh, Michael, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Dennis. How are you? What's your question? Well, this is kind of off topic, but I, I read about Uruguay and the church leadership down there telling oh. all the politicians that are behind that abortion thing down there that they're going to be excommunicated. Not off topic at all. Not off topic at all. I read that over the weekend and was like, amen. Amen. See, that doesn't seem so hard to do, right? Hey, you voted to you voted for abortion. You voted to make it legal. You vote you're excommunicated. Next. That wasn't so hard, was it? No. And why is our leadership in this country not following suit, okay? Excellent. Thank you very much, Dennis. That is a great question. If anybody who's at the USCCB is listening or spying on us or whatever, please pick up the phone and calls and tell us why the bishops in Uruguay can say, oh, you supported abortion, Mr. Catholic? You're excommunicated. And over here in America, we have to say, well, it's not really Canon 915. It's Canon 916 that applies. And we have to do everything very privately and behind the scenes. Well, we have negotiations going up. What? You're excommunicated. Two words. You're excommunicated. See how easy that is? They get it in Latin America. It's very easy. Well, no, I'm, I'm getting told by Matthew in the booth that's three words. No, it's a contraction, so I think it's one word. Eh, whatever. It's less than four words. You're excommunicated. <laughs> All right. Uh, this poll, that, uh, the survey that was done by the Brookings Institute, um, measured how many people in the, uh, in the country are religiously affiliated versus uh, versus religiously unaffiliated, meaning they don't have any kind of connection to religion at all, if, you know, anything from atheist up to maybe just grandma says God every now and then. That's about it. Interesting, what they discovered was that more children today, this is one of their sum-ups, more children today are growing up in homes in the United States that have no religious affiliation, more children than not. Can you imagine that? There's no training, no information at all. This is becoming a pagan nation. Now, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be very, uh, it shouldn't be very surprising. I mean, there's a number of Western nations already. You want to see a pagan nation, as Father Benedict Rochelle said once, you want to see a pagan nation, <laughs> go to the United Kingdom. It is a massively pagan. Uh, there are more, it's interesting that the Church of England, obviously, is the official state religion in England, in, in, the, United, in the United Kingdom. More Catholics who, by the way, it was illegal for a good long, good, good amount of time to be a Catholic in England. More Catholics go to Mass on Sunday in England than members of the Church of England, the official state religion, attend their services. That's, that's just, that shows you the state of affairs in England. Um, now, among the irreligious uh, American crowd, not surprising, the vast majority... Three quarters compared to a quarter. Three quarters of them support Obama. Ha! Ah, there's a, there's a newsflash. Stop the presses. Now, religious Americans, obviously, are more likely to vote for Obama. One of the things they did here in the, in the, the Brookings Institute did was sit down and figure out, um, is sit down and figure out, you know, is this irreligious American sort of one group, or is it sort of, you know, is it one homogeneous group, or is it made up of different things? Well, they sat down and they broke it apart, and here's how they broke it apart. They said it really is, the, the irreligious Americans group is sort of a composition of three groups, roughly the same size. Uh, they called one, one portion the seculars, another one the atheists and agnostics, and the other one the unattached believers. Now, the atheists and the agnostics were the ones that were sort of more or most hostile to religion in general. 
uh, being atheists, that makes sense. And uh, they were the, in those subcategories, they were the group that was most supporting Obama. The next group, which is the largest of the three, not much more than atheists, is seculars, or people who are just kind of indifferent to religion. They're more concerned with money and career advancement and that sort of thing. And then there was another, the other group of the three, which was the smaller one, that they, they tagged the unattached believers, meaning they had some sort of passing... Uh, you know, they understood maybe there was a God, but, you know, they didn't belong to a religion. They sort of typified themselves as, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, and you've, you've heard that line uh, quite often. Uh, the portion of them, I believe it was close to 20%, wasn't it? The irreligious were about 20%. I'm checking with our crack researcher, Phil, over here on the side. Uh, I believe it was about 20%. It was very close. And uh, that, the, that hefty a percentage of people in the uh, uh, in the United States would be irreligious and then break down into those categories. That's a little frightening. Uh, it's it, what that portends for the future, and a large number of them are young. Uh, so that's quite the, uh, you know, scary, scary statistic uh, when you look at it. Now, what portion of the irreligious of those three groups are made up with of, of made up of former Catholics? Some of you may remember that there was a poll done by Gallup about two years ago that said 10%, 10% of Americans, one out of every 10 Americans walking around was a former Catholic. If that isn't disturbing enough, a for, identified themselves as a former Catholic, that's, that's frightening. Well, what's the number now? It's actually gotten worse two years later today, according to the Brookings Institute and their big massive survey project here. Now it's one out of every nine Catholics walking around, or nine out of nine, one out of every nine Americans walking around as a former Catholic, one out of nine. It's a, little, uh, it's a little disturbing because when they leave the church and they join this irreligious group, whatever category, subcategory they get into, seculars, atheists, unattached kind of spiritual but not religious, this group votes for the most liberal candidates, the most liberal policies that that exist. They're pro-abortion, pro-same-sex marriage, the whole bit. That group is expanding, and it's expanding with an injection of a good number of former Catholics, and it's growing in, in large. So this is the reason some of these elections are so close, because America is undergoing a massive, massive transformation of a country founded on uh, uh, you know, that lived, not founded necessarily, but lived these very, uh, uh, very uh, strict moral code, and it is abandoning that. So that's the issue. We've got uh, from a, a call from San Diego. Patrick is on the line from San Diego. Patrick, call in. What you? What's up? How are you doing? Mr. Voris, thank you for taking my call. Hi. Oh, no problem. It's Michael, by the way. My, da- my dad's Mr. Voris, and by the way, he's like 80. Time corrected me on that. Thanks. <laughs> he's 83 today. I just want to say happy birthday to my dad. He's 83 years old today, so happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday to Dad. Okay. Uh, I had a question real quick, and I'll just take it off the air here. Um, okay, I see the cafeteria Catholic thing, and I even deal with that in my own family. It's frustrating. Um, uh, but being Hispanic, I see the vote, you know, they, they're talking about, what, 45% or something of Hispanics or whatever voting for Obama. And I tell myself, this is crazy. These people have lost touch with their religion. And uh, what I, my question is this, is don't you think it's time for the Pope to come to America, like he just did in Mexico, and give a homily and just put it in black and white so the bishops can hear this and the people can hear this? And don't you think that would invigorate the faith? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Patrick. Good question. Yeah, I th- first of all, let's talk, let's, we'll get some numbers out for you here. This is from the Brookings survey again. Uh, that one of their findings, Hispanic Catholics are more likely than white Catholics to have a favorable opinion of Barack Obama, 70% versus 48%, uh, while white Catholics are more likely than Hispanic Catholics to have a favorable view of Mitt Romney. Uh, so it, it is interesting that when you go through the, the, the sort of the, the, the breakdown of Hispanic Catholics, which is about a little less than a third Uh, of the uh, overall U.S. Catholic population versus white Catholics. Uh, There really is a break. White Catholics, who have been here in the culture much longer, are much more assimilated into the American culture. And as America has become progressively more liberal and less uh, attuned with the spiritual, the religious and the spiritual, 
American Catholics have gone along with that. So we have you know lukewarm Catholics or you know what some people have termed uh, Unitarian Catholics, Catholics who sort of have gone the way of the Unitarian Church. They've kind of compromised everything in sight. Uh, so it remains a bit of a mystery, though, that uh, why Hispanic Catholics would be so democratic because many, many, many democratic. Uh, party positions are all so anti-church, anti-moral, anti-God, anti-religion, anti, anti-anything that used to be the case yet. So you've got this like strange juxtaposition within the Hispanic Catholic community of a group that is very, very conservative. Hispanic Catholics, uh, Hispanic Catholics do not support abortion like white Catholics do. They don't support divorce. They don't support same-sex marriage. Nowhere near on the scale that whites do. And yet whites are a little bit more inclined to vote for the Republican candidate than Hispanics, who are much more inclined to vote for the Democratic candidate. Somehow the word is not getting into the Hispanic community. There's only one of two options. Either the word is not getting in what the Democrats actually do stand for uh, when it comes to all of these moral issues, the social issues, or it is getting in and immigration is the... uh, Immigration is uh, is outranking that, and you know, but you know, we don't know. I don't. We probably haven't. I haven't seen any polling information on that. But yes, to your point, um, if the uh, Patrick, if the Pope could come um, and sort of lay it out. Now, you do have to say when he was over here a few years ago, he kind of did lay it out. He he still did kind of lay it out. He said what needed to be said. He said, you know, Catholic colleges need to be Catholic again. Uh, I think something that a lot of Catholics need to realize, though, is that. Uh, the Pope himself, particularly in the Western nations, the United States and Europe, uh, he is very oftentimes disregarded by uh, people in the church, uh, you know, some bishops, different priests. You know, you, you can jump on practically any liberal Catholic blog site or publication, and they, you know, just say things kind of, you know, you know, oh, that's fine for the Bishop of Rome, but he's not my bishop. And, th- and so um, there is a, uh, he probably had a little, he probably had a little bit more, uh, how should we say, uh, uh, a receptive audience when he was in Mexico than he does in the West. The West is under the impression that it doesn't need religion, that it doesn't need, uh, that it doesn't need, um, uh, it doesn't need God. You know, like Bishop Sheen said, you know, it's the social issues that matter. God is dead as far as the Western mind is concerned. We're going back to paganism. So I'm not sure the Pope saying, you know, one thing or another is going to make them do. Uh, uh, is going to make them do anything at all. It would be a shot in the arm to faithful Catholics, but this destruction is so bad, it's so vast, that it's almost like the entire thing needs to be rebuilt from the ground up all over again. We're going to take a quick break, come back here a little bit more about Bishop Sheen and take some more callers standing by. And if you're still wanting to call in, the number is 646-200-0903. What do you think? Have lukewarm Catholics, have Unitarian Catholics, generic Catholics, has this crowd helped ruin... The American culture. 646 200 0903. We'll be right back in a moment. Catholics, Catholics are, are born, born for combat. And having the right ammunition to defend and learn the faith is easy. Just aim your browser at churchmilitant.tv. Go to our login page and sign up by clicking on the premium member icon. Then you and your family can choose from hundreds of on demand programs, all for about 33 cents a day. Become a premium member of churchmilitant.tv today. All right, folks, we're back here. We have John from Massachusetts uh, still holding. Want to come back and take uh, talk about voting for a second. John, how are you? Hi. I just, I'm sorry. I called back because I had one other question for you. Um, have you heard, I'm sure you have, of um, Christopher Ferreira? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I was actually at a okay. conference that have, he was at. Have having. you read his book, Liberty, The God That Failed? No, I actually have a copy of it. I ha- I've looked through it, but I haven't actually had a chance to read it yet. He, he is exactly, he's hitting what you're saying. Lukewarm, first of all, my personal opinion, there's no such thing as a lukewarm Catholic. You're either Catholic or you're not. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Now, what, what Mr. Ferrara is arguing is liberty, as it was written in the Constitution, it, it doesn't protect anybody. Liberty is a god, and and that doesn't mean that. In other words, Catholics were not considered, as you well know, and you said earlier when you show it was the country was not founded on Catholic tradition. No, it wasn't. In fact, it was a Protestant country, and it hasn't changed. 
We've we've never been a Catholic country. Now you can say you can say that Bishop Sheen, yes, at that point he was he had the TV show and everything like that. But when were we a Catholic country? When were we guided by the Catholic Church? Never, ever. No, oh, it's very it's, it's that's very true, John. We have a uh, I I think a lot of people when they. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of Catholics today, when they look at the United States and they hear these things like, you know, a uh, you know founded on Judeo-Christian principles and this, you know, that's not entirely true. It was founded the, the country was really founded on you know principles that you would more sort of align with deist principles. There was not a a solid bedrock of Christian uh, culture, and certainly, <laughs> and certainly, it was not. Catholic by any stretch. As a matter of fact, lots of people don't know that in the original 13 colonies, it was illegal to be Catholic in 11 of them. Yep, 11 uh, colonies outlawed the Catholic Church uh, up until a certain time, obviously, when it was all done. So this idea that you know, America was this always kind of religious. Free. There was not religious freedom in the United States in the original thirteen colonies, anyway. Uh, that uh, like the people imagine that oh, isn't this nice and religion can thrive? And no, this was a very rigidly uh, defined, narrow set of uh, of interpretations of how religion could be. And you know, paying lip service or homage uh, in the Declaration of Independence to. Uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, these are God-given rights. So, you know, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, yeah, I mean, as far as it goes, that's true. But that's where it ends. It never goes on to spelling this out. It, it, it just, it, it sets. It, look, the American experience came out of the age of the Enlightenment. It did not develop the way it did in Europe with the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror over there, because it was, it wasn't uh, available over here. But you know there was a rebellion here. There was, but you know um, this was not a revolution. It was a war of independence. That's different than a revolution in France, uh, in France that took place. So, but what we're left with here now in the United States is this kind of leftover mush, where some people think it's religious, some people think it's Judeo-Christian. It's just moral. I can be religious or and and spiritual. I can just be spiritual. I don't need to be religious. Uh, the freedom of man is what counts. It's it, it's this big mish. And it's falling apart, and it was always bound to fall apart. So, uh, and speaking of falling apart, uh, let's go back to another quote we have from the Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen. What are we going to do about it? Are our judges going to be so weak they will release every criminal? Are we going to allow hangers on? Minutemen to determine our policy and to be led by a group that is interested only in the overthrow of American society, such as the French government was overthrown in 1789, though there's no comparison as regards the value of the governments. But, as Lincoln said, God meant this country for serious purposes. Let us, in the name of God, rediscover those purposes. And what are those purposes? If you were to ask the average American today, uh, just walking down the street, what do you think the purpose of the nation is? You're probably going to get some inane thing like, uh, I don't know, to give me my Obama phone or, uh, you know, make sure that my education is paid for or, you know, the, the idea of higher no, noble purposes just doesn't exist anymore. And you, to whatever degree it might have existed, it is certainly less now. But I want to go back to a line that he said right here. Are we going to allow hangers on, Minutemen, to determine our policy and to be led by a group that is only interested in the overthrow of the American society? What a fantastic insight that is. Again, this was uh, taken from one of his shows, uh, uh, Life is Worth Living, back in the 50s, it was 60 years ago. What did he see 60 years ago? You, if you'd have said that out on the street and some party would have run on this, like, hey, there's these people interested in overthrowing our American society and the values that you know, we attach to the divine with all, they would have laughed you off the stage. They didn't laugh Sheen off the stage. But this is so far in advance. This is you know, obviously one of the things that uh, this isn't a Bishop Sheen plug show, but I guess it 
it has those elements in it. The man was a prophet. He understood all of this stuff very, very clearly. He could see it coming. And he saw, remember, he was also, you know, priest before he was, uh, you know, bishop and archbishop, uh, uh, archbishop. He was, he dealt with people, he talked, and he could see the moral decay starting on the perimeter of, of the culture. And he knew what was, uh, he knew what was, uh, uh, what was coming down the road, which is why he started warning about it. Now, we have another quote from Bishop Sheen we would like you to, uh, like to play for you. Um, also, well, hold on a second. I would actually want to go back to something else here. Uh, in the, uh, I want to go back and review a couple of uh, couple of numbers we threw out earlier because I think this is really staggering. Twelve percent of American Catholics today are of Americans today are former Catholics. Twelve percent, one out of every nine, and this should be a statistic that should totally alarm and upset any of the leadership in the Church in America. Catholics are more likely than Protestants to leave their religion. This is our numbers. This is from the Brookings Institute. It's a very, very extensive study. Thousands and thousands of people. One out of nine Catholics, one out of nine Americans today are former Catholics. Two years ago, it was one out of every ten. And Catholics are more likely than Protestants to leave their religion. Now, as you look around the Catholic landscape in the United States today, what do you see? What do you see? You see a church kind of falling apart. Uh, you know, the bishops are ignored when they say something, you know, traditional about the faith. They're ignored when they say something uh, kind of liberal in the political realm. They have just simply, they've just simply become unplugged from the culture, or the culture has shoved them off, because the idea of staying true to the faith and the truths of the faith has just not happened uh, in the American church leadership. It's been it, those who've stayed true. There's always these other things. We've got to include immigration. We've got to include minimum wage. Gotta, and it all looks the same. And when you keep talking and keep saying, and you, know, you have an opinion on everything, well, in the end, nobody cares about your opinion at all. And so what happens is the American hierarchy's role as uh, people who are supposed to, you know, leaders who are supposed to step out and shepherd their sheep just gets disregarded. And then because and then that sort of creates the cyclical thing that they know they're disregarded, so now they're afraid to say anything because it's going to increase the amount that they're disregarded by. Uh, we're going to take a call from Katie from Berkeley, Michigan. Katie, right around the corner. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Mike? Doing very well. Say so the reason I'm calling is to comment on something your um, last caller said when he said that we've never been a Catholic country, and although that's true, I think that we are always heavily influenced by the Catholic faith because the Catholic faith has all the sacraments and we have the fullness of the faith. And so the Catholic faith is very powerful and really influences our society when we live our faith. But when we drop the ball, society deteriorates. Abs- that is that is absolutely true. Couldn't have said it better myself, but I'll try. <laughs> if If the Catholic Church is the bulwark against evil... And, and that is what we are baptized for, that's what we have the sacraments for, so that we become holy and, uh, and increase in holiness during our life, and we are supposed to be the light to the world and the salt of the earth and the leaven, and we're not doing that, well, what else is going to do it? So when you see the culture falling apart, look, that's a big red flag. When the culture's falling apart, that means something is wrong in the church, not in the indefectible bride of Christ, but in the, uh, uh, in, the actual, uh, uh, in the actual sort of operation of the church. It's lost its mission, it's lost its way, and it needs to come back. A friend of mine sent me an email and said, yeah, Holy Mother Church is very sick today, and we faithful Catholics really have to sort of tend to our mother's bedside and take care of, uh, uh, take care of, take care of business, really. Listen, we're going to take a 30-second break, Katie. Thank you very much for your call. We'll take a 30-second break here and come right back. From ChurchMilitant.tv's new series, Right Reason, Dr. Charles Rice explains, Pope John Paul said faith and reason are like two wings on which we rise to the truth. Become a premium member today to gain the right reason to understand your Catholic faith. Michael Voris launched his apologetics mission with his groundbreaking series, The One True Faith. This series, with over 100 hours of orthodox commentary, covers every possible Catholic topic in tremendous detail. To explore The One True Faith, sign up for a premium membership today. 
I've heard the premium memberships on uh, Real Catholic t- or on uh, ChurchMilitant.tv. Sorry, some old habits die hard. Those uh, memberships on ChurchMilitant.tv are they're really good. I think they're a, a good deal. I, I, I've, I've heard that, so it's something you should consider. Helps helps keep us alive. Uh, now, I want to go into a little uh, little history thing here just before we wrap up for today. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, traveled across America. Uh, a couple hundred years ago, and had a wonderful experience while he was here. He he really saw this the the, the burgeoning. He was a, he was an extremely faithful Catholic uh, from France, and he comes to America and he, he he took all of his writings and everything that he had seen here and put them together in a book called Democracy in America. And I'd like to read a quote from you. He says, "Freedom sees religion as the companion of its struggles and triumphs, the cradle of its infancy." and the divine source of its rights. Religion is considered the guardian of mores, and mores are regarded as the guarantee of the laws and a pledge for the maintenance of freedom itself. He saw back then in the uh, 1800s, the early 1800s, he saw the intimate connection between freedom and religion, that religion bolsters the practice, the authentic practice of a religion bolsters uh, faith, it, it, it increases holiness, it makes men more free, not less free. And uh, it really is, uh, for him to have said, you know, he saw, he saw it instantly. And at the time, that was able, you, you were able to, uh, uh, to see that in America. That has become less and less and less uh, prevalent, as we see here. You know, America is becoming more and more uh, irreligious. Take a call from Dwayne in Indio, California. Dwayne, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, thank you. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you Glad for calling. I got in. I just, well, I didn't have a question. Or rather, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment on on the direction that the state of the church as it exists today, and and the. Uh, direction it's going. Um, I think what's going to end up happening is it, it's going to, we're going to continue in a downward trend. We're going to continue to fall apart because there just doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency amongst the priests and bishops or even the laity. Uh, that this is, We're going to continue along with society, along with our culture in a downward trend until eventually, some years in the future, we're going to completely collapse and fall apart, and we're going to just have nowhere else to turn. We're going to be destitute, and uh, we'll have nowhere else to turn but to God. And uh, and from that point, once we hit rock bottom, you know, at that point we can rebuild, or those who are around at that time can rebuild, but. It just seems to be the American way where we don't learn from mistakes of the past. We, I, think we, I, think, uh, I think that's more the human way. Uh, it just, right. so happens, just so happens that America is uh, uh, America's sitting on top of the world right now, just like the Romans were at one point, and uh, you know, different civilizations and nations have been at different times. And look, you know, the, the effects of original sin, concupiscence, greed, getting fat and happy, whatever you want to call it, all of these things combined, which is human nature, always results in the fall. But Catholics cannot tie themselves to a civilization. You know, this is what St. Augustine meant when he wrote The City of God in the early 5th century. You know, you know, you know, we are in the city of man, but we are citizens of the city of God. We're going to take a couple more calls, but thank you very much. Couldn't agree with your point more. Thank you. Tim from Lansing, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Michael? Doing very well. You had a comment on public education? Yeah, I believe the one of the main uh, causes for this collapse you see in the West, especially in America, uh, is the fact that um, Christians, uh, Catholic or, or Protestant, send their kids to uh, public schools. And it's not just the content that's being taught, but it's, it's also the form of the education itself. It takes over the parenting. Um, and, and just to throw a few comments on there, uh, Lenin said himself, give us the, the child for eight years and he will be a Bolshevik forever. Yep. Or Adolf Hitler, give me the textbooks and I'll control the state. It is aligned with the Jewish maxim, I mean not the Jewish, but the Jesuit maxim, which is, give me the child until he's seven and I'll give you the man. Absolutely, yeah. It was the famous quote, you know, as the, uh, as the, as the uh, sapling is bent, so grows the tree. So. I, th- I think until that's uh, reversed, until uh, the church takes 
back over educating its own until Christians, uh, Catholic or, or whatever, mainly Catholic, but um, until they start educating their own, uh, the collapse will continue because there's no reason for them to re- to go to something that's foreign to them. And at that yeah. point, it is foreign. Yeah, it's a very, that's a very good point. I thank you. Thank you very much for calling in, Tim. We appreciate it. I, I think that's a very good point. The, the, you know, the intellectual, if you want to call it that, the intellectual life of many Americans has been corrupted uh, in public education, and that corruption crept over into and has essentially engulfed much of Catholic education uh, as well. Uh, you know, people coming out of Catholic schools today, uh, for the most part. I mean, there's exceptions here and there, of course. There's always exceptions, but the rule is, Catholics coming out of uh, out of anybody coming out of Catholic schools knows not, absolutely nothing about the faith. You know, and uh, anybody who's in their you know 40s, 50s, or whatever, bump into a lot of people when we go out on different talks, and it's amazing. It's amazing the lack of knowledge of the faith. You can be talking to somebody who's a brain surgeon, you know, in charge of some great, but but when you talk to them about the faith. They speak to you, but, but when you talk to them about the faith, they speak to you with the education level of a third grader or a fourth grader, and you, you hear the questions that they ask and say to yourself, wow, they really don't know anything about the faith. They, they know only the slightest little bit about the faith. Uh, just as we get ready to wrap up, we only got a couple minutes left, uh, I want to read a, uh, one more paragraph that uh, our, uh, one of our viewers, Dan Shea, sent us with regard to uh, morality, specifically Catholics, and how they have to help shape the culture. He says, quote, The demands of morality require each generation to continue to make installment payments on the freedom purchased by the down payment of their forefathers. Within a free society, there is no sanctuary from the demands of morality. What a tremendous, uh, what a tremendous quote that is. And uh, I just want to say, Dan, thank you. Uh, thank you very much again for uh, your, your article. Did read it. He sent me an email and said, "I hope you read this." And uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, it was very good. I'd like to go back to. Uh, there's two quotes here that I also think he sent us that were were very good. One is the Socrates quote. Uh, roll up one more. Roll up. <laughs> no up. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Okay, we're getting to it. Keep going. One more page. There. Uh, In summoning up the courage to articulate and defend Catholic beliefs, it should be noted that Socrates said, one must risk appearing arrogant to speak the truth. Imagine that. You have to appear arrogant to speak the truth. Are Catholics who stand up for the faith not constantly called superior, arrogant, puffed up, proud, intolerant? Well, of of course you have to. That's going to happen. When you're standing up against an ocean of filth coming at you and you say stop you look like the weirdo oh well that's that's too bad you gotta you know you have to you have to run the risk of appearing arrogant and also like to uh get one more quote in here read one from bishop sheen uh he said truth by its nature is not tolerant it must reject error see the black and white of Catholic morality, and this has been abandoned in the Catholic education system, as Tim and Lansing said to us, as uh, uh, John from Massachusetts noted to us, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name in uh, in California. It, it, every the whole thing's falling apart. Why is Obama even close to being reelected? The guy shouldn't even be in the country anymore. And I'll, I'll leave that comment alone for <laughs> for people. Uh, I want to play one last. Uh, uh, comment from Archbishop Fulton Sheen here uh, and think about this at the end. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, politics don't matter. It's the very last thing. What does matter is this. Pay attention. And it makes no difference which road you travel. At the end of all of these roads, you are going to see two faces. either the merciful face of Christ or the horrible face of Satan. And either one at the end of your life will say, Mine. Mine. Play not, therefore, with that which is evil. Folks, in less than two weeks, we determine the leader of the free world. Make sure you make the right choice. A good Catholic simply cannot vote for Obama. 
Just thank, thank the whole crew out here, Phil, all the camera guys, the guys in the booth there, Matt, Mike, Charlie, uh, Caitlin, Callie, everybody. God bless everyone. We'll see you next week. Good night. God bless. <laughs>